I bring life and hope. Alex Straza, aspect of the Red Dragon Flight, is the guardian of all life on Azeroth. She was one of the five great dragons chosen by the Titans to become the Aspects after they defeated Galakrond, a massive cannibalistic dragon who turned against his kind. The other Aspects were Ysera, her sister, Nosdormu, Malagos, and Neltherion, or as we know him today, Deathwing. They were chosen to be empowered with a portion of the Pantheon's power, and rule over each of their flights while they watched over Azeroth and its inhabitants. Eonar, the Titan patron of all life, was the one to give Alexstrasza a portion of her power. And ever after, Alexstrasza would be known as the Lifebinder, working to safeguard all living creatures creatures of Azeroth. Due to her supreme wisdom and limitless compassion for all living things, Alexstrasza was crowned the Dragon Queen and given dominion over her kind. In Hearthstone, Alexstrasza is a legendary neutral minion card from the classic set. She is a 9-mana 8-8 dragon that reads Battlecry, set a hero's remaining health to 15. This effect directly alters the hero's health and as such does not count as either a healing effect or a damaging one. It also bypasses armor, meaning that it will neither decrease or increase whatever armor they were at before. Since the early days of Hearthstone, Alexstrasza was a very flexible card. She could be used in control decks to provide some late game sustain, and in combo decks to bring your opponent down to a manageable health size. Nowadays, Alexstrasza primarily serves the latter role, but is flexible enough to be used for healing when need be. Uh, in Arena, this card is absolute garbage because uh, by the time you get to turn 9, basically both players are at 15 life anyway. And you have, again, that problem of, yeah, if you're behind you can heal, but if you're behind just playing one dude, one thing that turned not being able to perform that action, just kind of screws you over. That's kind of the issue, and that's a very, uh, a very repeating thing among the dragons. They're just too one-dimensional, and as the game gets more and more complex, it's harder to play them, so that's that's really the drawback. The first two decks that Alexstrasza ever saw play in was Freeze Mage and Control Warrior, or more commonly known as Wallet Warrior back then. Freeze Mage used Alexstrasza aggressively as many of the combo pieces added up to 15. In that deck, she was one of the core cards, and every time it came down on the board, you knew you were dead in the next turn or two. So Alexstrasza, I think, is a great card when you know you are, when you know for sure that you are two or three turns away from death and that is because let's say your opponent is at near for at near or full health you can use the battle cry of Alexstrasza on your opponent's hero instead of your own and they'll suddenly feel pressured since two hits from just Alexstrasza would surely kill them in Control Warrior, she would sometimes be used to provide health, but was once again mostly used as a finisher. After casting and with a weapon equipped, you were able to finish them off with a Gromosh and Cruel Taskmaster combo. After the launch of the game, Freeze Mage and Control Warrior remained at the top of the meta for about a year, and in tandem, so did Alexstrasza. As the decks using her began to be more and more tuned, Alexstrasza only started to be cut from lists with the introduction of League of Explorers. The meta shift that Explorers caused was massive. Control Warrior was no longer Wallet Warrior, as you removed most of your legendaries like Alexstrasza and replaced them with the least Star Seeker and more removal and armor gain. Similarly, in Freeze Mage, she couldn't do much anymore, with the introduction of Reno Jackson to the format. When Whispers of the Old Gods was introduced in April of 2016, Freeze Mage went into hibernation, now replaced by Yogg Tempo Mage. In contrast, Wallet Warrior made a resurgence as Nazoth Warrior. This meant that it was finally time for Alexstrasza to return and be teched into the deck. However, it wasn't the staple it used to be. Value mattered greatly during that meta, since Agra was fairly non-existent once Goblins vs Gnomes left rotation. Nazoth and the powerful Deathrattle minions that came along with him resulted in Nazoth Warrior seeing more play than Elise Warrior, and it will continue to see play until Mean Streets of Gadgetsan came around. Patches and Kazakus again shifted the meta drastically, and by now we understood how powerful the end-of-the-year expansions were. Reno Mage was now replaced with Freeze Mage, and Nazoth Warrior was completely gone. Reno Mage was a value-oriented control deck that included Kazakus and Reno with a combo finish. Everything in that deck fit perfectly, and since Reno Mage could generate board pressure, Alexstrasza could once again serve as the combo setup. Once you put your opponent down to 15 health, you can play Ink Master Solia into Pyroblast, into Frostbolt, and then Ice Lance to deal 17 damage. Sad to say, Reno Mage lasted only two months. Along with Journey to Ungoro came the Hall of Fame, and not only did cards like Reno and Tharson rotate out, Ice Lance was removed entirely from Standard. This meant that Freeze Mage was no longer viable, but from its ashes rose Burn Mage, more commonly known as Gunther Mage. This deck removed all of the Freeze and Control tools to add tempo cards like the One Mana Mana Worm, Medivh's Valet, and Medivh himself. Yet again, Alexstrasza was primed to be added to the deck. You had the early game pressure of Mana Worm combined with Atesh for late game value and aided by Firelands Portal and Pyroblast for the burn. This was a very popular deck back then. And with Reno and other neutral heal effects gone from standard, Alexstrasza looked more promising than ever, serving its finisher role once more. 
However, as is the usual story, this deck did not last long either. The next expansion, Knights of the Frozen Throne, not only changed the meta, but how the game was played as a whole. With the introduction of Death Knights, the 5 armor that they gave your hero was already too much for Alexstrasza to get any value out of. But on top of that, this was the beginning of the Druid meta, with Ultimate Infestation being introduced. Even with Fringe play in Big Druid for a month, Alexstrasza just wasn't good enough anymore. Kobolds and Catacombs made her even less valuable, with Q-Block and Raza Priest being able to deal over 20 damage easy without needing her help. It's very hard in this meta to do anything with old school Control Warrior. Against the Holy Trinity, you only have like one good matchup, and that's Tampa Rogue. The other two, Rosaka's Priest and Jay Druid, are, I don't want to say impossible to win, but the win rate against them is like abysmal. With the Witchwood came a new year of standard. You would think that the meta would be shattered, but alas, Knights and Kobolds put the game in a strange place. While the cards were fun and powerful, you couldn't imagine playing anything else in their place. With the minimal impact that the Witchwood had, Q-Block and even Paladin was nerfed. So it was finally time to see some new decks come into play. One of them was Mind Blast Priest. While Raza was gone, Shadow Reaper Anduin and Mind Blast stayed, bringing forward a control deck that could burn your opponent down. Two Mind Blasts and three Void Form Pings were 16 damage, meaning that it was finally time for Alexstrasza to shine yet again. Alexstrasza having the Dragon Shell was an added bonus, since you could run the powerful Dragon Shell with Primordial, Twilight Drakes, and best of all, Dusk Breakers. Malagos Druid was something else that popped up out of nowhere and dominated the meta. Back then, Dream Petal Florist and Flabidinous Floop were not cards that existed yet, so you had to rely on Twig of the World Tree and Faceless Manipulator to fulfill the 26 damage combo. However, Twig could be easily broken, so Alexstrasza served as a secondary win condition. Since Druid had both Ramp and Ultimate Infestation, when Alexstrasza was played on Curve, it was terrifying. Because of this, Alexstrasza became a staple in that deck. After the Boomsday Project, Malagos Druid just got stronger with the addition of Floop and Florist. Alexstrasza remained in the deck and served its sole purpose. Except now you had three ways to combo your opponent instead of the previous two. Rastakhan's Rumble, the last expansion of 2018, didn't manage to shake up the meta too much either. This resulted in a swift Druid nerf causing Malagos Druid to disappear. However, this change brought back Mind Blast Priest. The deck had two new additions, Fire Tree Witch Doctor and Crowd Roaster, which were great for its Dragon Synergy portion. As of today, the meta has settled and Alexstrasza is still present in Malagos Druid and Control Priest. It has the potential of being extremely overpowered and unbalanced, and it historically has been. Uh, that Molten Giant, like, OTK Warrior deck was, and Control, like, especially Freeze Mage, you know. All it takes is a Fireball, Fireball, Frostbolt. That's 10 mana, 3 cards. Uh, and you've killed your opponent. It's not that good of a card right now, but when it is good, it's really, really, really good. Being in the classic set, Alexstrasza will never rotate, meaning that it'll always remain as a possible inclusion in any strategy that wants a flexible card that can both set up a kill or save the game. As always, thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.